All right, so my name's Dan Harmon. I'm a program manager on the PowerShell team. And in this session is PowerShell Repositories Unleashed. So what I'm going to talk about are a couple of new things that we've included in the WMF5 preview. How many of you have, by show of hands, have had a chance to take a look at WMF5 preview either? Pretty much everybody, OK. Uh, have you guys taken a look at the April? Or is anybody taking a look at the September one? which is newer? OK, great. Yeah, so there's a couple new features we have in the WMF5 preview uh, that I'll be talking about today. The first is OneGit, which is uh, a new PowerShell module. It makes it easier to install software packages from various repositories. Uh, the, other the other feature is a new PowerShell module we call PowerShell Get. Can you speak up? Sure. The other feature is uh, a module we call PowerShell Get which makes it really easy to interact with module repositories, uh, local and online repositories. And then I'm also going to show how you can set up your own internal PowerShell Git repository. OneGit is, as I mentioned, a new module that we have in WMF5 that makes it much easier to discover, inventory, and install software packages from a variety of repositories, uh, both online and, and local stores. Uh, the key value prop with OneGit is that it provides a unified package management interface. We have a set of commandlets, but we also have a C-sharp API. And I know the team has talked about um, potentially having an, a WMI interface. That's not there yet, but we at least have the, the first two. The other key piece is that it it's really agnostic of the underlying installation technology that it's interacting with. So you can think of it as sort of a package manager manager. It has uh, an extensible architecture that allows it to have these different package manager providers that plug in to OneGit, and those things can talk to different uh, package managers for like MSI, for example, or MSU, or NuGet, or whatever the the installation technology is, those things know how to know how to install it and they plug into, into OneGit. That also allows those providers to talk to a variety of different repositories. So through a single interface, you're able to, to talk to lots of different things that can install in lots of different repositories. Now the WMF5 preview, the April one shipped with a provider for chocolatey packages. And then they took that out in the September uh, preview. But um, they're, work, they're working through some issues. So they're going to be adding that back. But also, if you go and you download the latest experimental build from OneGit.org, that has the chocolatey package with it and also a bunch of additional packages. And I'll be showing a few of those. In terms of the architecture, at a high level, you've got a set of new PowerShell commandlets that you interact with. And those talk to the OneGit APIs, which is a public C Sharp API. And then from there, you have the one, the one get core engine that is really responsible for doing the demuxing to the, all the different package managers or, or providers that are installed. So you got things like uh, PowerShell Get. Uh, there's, a, there's a provider for Chocolatey. There's another one for MSI. MSUs are like the Microsoft updates. Um, and then you got ARP, the Atom Root programs. And then each one of those package providers can talk to one or more online repositories. So for example, a PowerShell Get provider can talk to the public uh, PowerShell gallery that, that we have. But it can also talk to the Chocolatey uh, repository. You have the Chocolatey provider, which is built on NuGet. That can talk to Chocolatey, of course. But it can also talk to a NuGet repository. Uh, the MSI package manager can talk to add and remove programs. MSU can talk to uh, the component-based servicing stack in Windows, which is what Windows Update is built on. Um, Etc. And there's also other package managers they're planning for things like you know, Visual Studio extensions, um, software ID tags, if you're familiar with those. So there's a lot of, of different providers and repositories that, that can be interacted with. So that's a high level view. Let me just uh, get straight to the demo now. So what I did, this is a, this is a clean build of uh, Windows Server 2012 R2. And then I installed the September preview on top of this. So PS version table, build 98.14. 
And then the one get module is available. So if you do get module, one get is there. Let's go ahead and import that. And then let's just get a list of commands on one get. To which? <laughs> you need more? Okay. Let's actually make it bold. Oh, okay. Let me see. I my scroll bars back. A little bit less here. Yeah. Okay. Is that a little better in the back? All right. So let's just group that on noun. So we have a set of commandlets. We have five commandlets for managing packages. We got a package provider commandlet in there, and then four for managing pa uh, what we call package sources. So first of all, let's take a look at the providers. So what is a provider? The way to think about OneGet, as I mentioned, is it's really a package manager manager. So the providers are the piece that implement uh, the different package managers that know, how to t that know how to install a specific type of software package, whether that's a PowerShell module or an MSI or an MSU or a NuGet package or what have you. So let's take a look at the list of package providers. Run get package provider. And with the September preview, we just have support for PowerShell modules. And this gives you, uh, you the ability to install PowerShell modules from online repositories. And I'll be drilling into that a little bit more when I talk about PowerShell Git. So the question is, how can I get some more providers? Um, fortunately, OneGit is smart enough to help you out with this a little bit. If you look at um, git command on git package provider, you can see it has this parameter called force bootstrap. And this will help downloading uh, the provider that you need. So for example, I can say git package provider, name NuGet, and I can force bootstrap it. I'll run verbose so you can see what it's doing here. And you can see it's going down to onegit.org and it's bootstrapping um, the nuget.exe that's needed for that provider. Um, right now, they only have support for bootstrapping the nuget, provi uh, nuget provider, but you can imagine that uh, they're adding support for, for more of those in the future. Um, you can also download, the to get more providers, you can download the latest build of OneGit from GitHub. And, the, and there are more providers uh, in, the, in the latest build. So let's just do that. <coughs> just go to onegit.org, onegit.zip. Let's just save that here in my downloads folder. And of course it came from the internet, so let's unblock it. And I don't know if you guys have tried out the uh, new archive commands that are in WMF Preview, but those are pretty handy here. Um, first, let's make a directory to stick it in. So a key thing here, if you're going to do this, make sure you don't overwrite the one get that's installed in WMF. That way, if you you know upgrade your WMF later, then you don't hose your machine. All right, let's go ahead and open a, a fresh PowerShell window. 
and we'll say import module on the one git we just downloaded. And let's run git package provider on this one. Okay, as you can see, there's a lot more included in the experimental build. Uh, there's some interesting things here. There, uh, you can see there's also the NuGet provider, which wasn't there yesterday. <laughs> I can tell you, uh, I've been you know doing the demos and uh, noticed that even this morning when I was running through again, there's some things that were changed. Uh, the NuGet provider being one of those. It uh, by default it used to be included, but it was hidden by default, and. Uh, it looks like Garrett's been doing some work and I think uh, has also changed the uh, chocolatey provider and uh, the NuGet provider is now visible. So that's that's an interesting change. I don't know if that's going to be permanent uh, or whether NuGet will go back to being hidden, but for now um, it is it is visible. If you wanted to use NuGet explicitly, a lot of the commandlets take a provider parameter and you can say NuGet if you want, even when it is hidden. So that's uh, just a little note. There's some other interesting providers here, like the ARP, that's for add remove uh, programs, <coughs> which is good for inventory. Um, key, thing, key limitation here right now, though, is that it doesn't uninstall. And of course, you can't install with it either. Um, the MSI provider does support enumeration, install, and uninstall. So that's a handy one. Um, there are a few here that are really experimental that aren't really working, that the SWID one, if you're familiar with the software ID tags. Uh, and Visual Studio extensions. These are kind of here, but they're not really implemented yet. And there's also support for MSU, which are the Microsoft Update Packages. Um, of course, there's Chocolatey, which is probably the most interesting one that we have right now. And um, providers really have uh, two main purposes. First of all, they know how to install the different software packages, um, but then they also give access to the online repositories. Um, whether those are new, you know, NuGet, the PowerShell Gallery, Chocolatey, etc. And in OneGet, the repositories are called package sources, and there's some package sources that are registered by default. You can find out what the package sources are with get package source. So you can see we have Chocolatey, NuGet again wasn't here yesterday, so that's that's a new addition, and the PowerShell Gallery is registered by default. Um, other thing to note is that um, the WMF5 preview has the latest bits for PowerShell Git, but it doesn't have the latest for OneGit. Um, OneGit is is comes out of the Open Technologies Group at Microsoft, and it's open source, and so the code is on GitHub. So they they're able to you know rev it really quickly, um, and you're able to get bits much faster, um, whereas PowerShell Git is is part of Windows and it goes out through the WMF. So you'll see those things aren't quite in sync right now as we're developing. You'll see some things that are um, that are similar, but that uh, similar in terms of the the concept, but maybe the names aren't exactly the same. So you'll see those things converge over time um, as we get closer to to shipping the final version. So let's take a closer look at the chocolatey package source. So let's go get package source, chocolatey. Here's another um, change that I noticed this morning. I don't know why it's returning this error. It's like there's two of them or something. Um, but just ignore that for now. So you got the name. That's kind of the friendly name of the package source. The location is where it's going to connect to the online repository to get its, uh, get its packages. Um, that the source is the name of that, that source. There's a provider friendly name and then the actual provider. And then there's a few things here that are uh, <coughs> sort of still under, under development. Um, is trusted is, is one of the flags that basically says whether you're going to be prompted when you install something from that repository. If you can see in PowerShell Git, we're, we're moving to call this um, installation policy because it's really analogous to execution policy where um, you can set uh, what the behavior is you want to you to have when you install something from that source. Is registered is also um, kind of sets us up for the future where you can have sources that are registered, meaning they persist across sessions, or you can have some that are just temporary in memory, so you don't change the state of the machine. And then validated is, you know, did we validate that that's, that URL, that location is, is valid and actually works. 
details right now. I think it's just a placeholder, so you can ignore that. All right. And then there's some other uh, package source commandlets that let you uh, customize and manage which repositories you want to connect to. So I'm not going to go through all these, but I'll just show those. You've got get, which we just talked about. Register, again, allows you to persist a package source across sessions. Unregister pulls it out. And then set lets you change things like the name, the location, whether it's trusted, things like that. All right, so once you get your um, package providers installed and all your sources registered, then finding packages is just really a breeze. You can say find package. And if you don't specify any parameters, what it's going to do is it's going to go talk to each of the registered providers and say, hey, go find all the packages in all the repositories that you know how to talk to. So you can see um, that it's going to come back with a lot of stuff. <laughs> and and uh, initially, it was just chocolatey. Now, again, this morning, it's also pulling stuff back from NuGet, um, which is pretty cool. Um, you can narrow that down with the name parameter. So you can say dash notepad, uh, for example. The interesting thing here is that this, uh, this doesn't really support wildcards the way you would think. It turns <laughs> out wildcarding is kind of tricky in this, in this world because um, each of the provider would have to implement the wildcards, and they all have different semantics for, for how wildcards are supported, and the syntax is all different. Um, we're working through those details so that we can have a consistent experience at the command level. But right now, it basically just does a substring match on the name. So if you do like notepad, it's going to return anything that has notepad in the name. Um, and it doesn't, you can't use the regular PowerShell wildcard characters yet. So that's, that's, we're trying to work through that. That should be coming soon. You can also see what um, other dependencies a package requires with this include dependencies parameter. So for example, I search notepad2, include dependencies. It just has the one package. There are no dependencies. But if I do, um, <coughs> let's try like, Notepad, uh, notepad, notepad plus plus. It's going to come back, and you can see it has the regular package, but then also has this dependency package. <coughs> so that's kind of handy. You can see, you know, which which additional things need to get pulled in right from find package. There are also a number of parameters on find module that control versioning, and we worked closely with the one get team to make sure that. The semantics are really similar for what we've done with modules. So we've thought a lot about versioning with modules. So um, for example, let's take a look at Notepad++. You can say all versions. And that's just going to pull down every version in, in every repository that you have registered. So you can see there's a lot of versions of Notepad++ in Chocolatey. You can also use the required version, and you can specify an exact version. So this is just like modules where you say required version. That's an exact match. You can use min version, which is interesting because what this will do is it will return the newest package that meets the minimum requirements. So that might not be exactly what you would have thought initially, but that we think that makes sense. That way, for example, if there's a breaking change in a package or some security bug that got fixed, say um, you want to have like a min baseline, but you just want to pick the, the latest, whatever is available. And if you want to see all the versions that match that, you can just say all versions, and that'll give you everything above the min version. And you can combine that with max, ver max version if you want. And that'll select a range of versions. So you get a lot of flexibility in terms of how, how you want to grab the versions. There's also a source parameter on find module that lets you pick exactly which repository you want to query. And then whatever source you specify, OneGit will automatically figure out what provider is required and pick the right provider. So you don't have to specify that. Um, but if you want, because multiple providers can talk to multiple repositories, you can be specific and override that default behavior. Um, for example, 
Um, I know that chocolatey packages are really just nougat packages with an install script. So I can say um, find package provider chocolatey source and make it talk to nougat.org and and have it typo and have it uh, grab grab a package from nougat and if you if you don't specify a source um, if you specify a source and it's not registered to any provider then NuGet will just go through and enumerate all the all the providers and ask them to query that source and find anything that that is at that source. So this is going to be over time. You can imagine this is going to be really handy because you could you could just do something like dump a whole bunch of packages of various types into some you know local directory, you know my packages or maybe this is a UNC path, and then you could just pipe it to install package. And OneGit will just go and, and ask all the providers to look at that source, and it'll uh, resolve the, the package type to the provider that knows how to install that, and just will install everything automatically. Um, there's also a credential parameter on find package. So th these will get passed to the provider. So this is for cases where the provider needs to authenticate to the source. For example, if you have to log in to a web service or something, or you know maybe you're authenticating over SSH or something like that. Uh, this is how you do that. And we talked about uh, force bootstrap on get package provider. Yeah, question. The question is: Is the provider providing installation options, or is it only downloading the package? The answer is it is providing uh, installation options, and I'm, I have a, a part of my demo. I'll, sh I'll, I'll walk through that. Uh, let's see. So there's force bootstrap on get package provider, but there's also force bootstrap on find package, and it'll silently bootstrap um, the provider that's needed to talk to that sor source. For example, if you go into um, program data where where one get keeps its provider assemblies. You can see that it bootstrapped NuGet. I just want to show this. So I close this and if I delete NuGet, open a new PowerShell, import module, I can say find package provider chocolatey which needs the NuGet, uh, that NuGet binary, Notepad2, force bootstrap. Boot, force bootstrap. Where is it? There we go. So it should, yes. Yeah, so it figured out it needs the NuGet, it bootstrapped it in, and then it went and talked to Chocolatey. So that's kind of handy if you don't happen to have that. And we'll be expanding the force bootstrap option to, <coughs> to more providers. So OneGit can also be used as a component or as an infrastructure piece that other components can build on. One of the things you'll notice for that is that all of the OneGit commandlets have a parameter on there called message resolver. So let me show you one. Um, find package. Where is it? There's a message resolver parameter. And, um, and what this does is it allows uh, another component to register a delegate that gets called back whenever that provider gets invoked or whether there's a message that gets passed back. And so then the, the, um, the message can be customized based on whatever the context is that it's being called in. So for example, this is how PowerShell get uh, get, gets custom strings back. So for example, it's installing modules. We change all the strings to say package to, to module to have the right context. Um, some other interesting some other interesting parameters on find package. Um, to get to that, that last question, you can see there's things like 
include Windows Installer. This is coming from, this is, these are all dynamic parameters that are coming from different uh, package providers that are registered. So this is for the ARP provider, which by default doesn't return MSIs. So in ARP, there's lots of different ways to get an entry into ARP, you know, install shield, null soft, you can run, run DLL32, lots of different things. And so we omit MSIs in there. So you can run that switch to include those. Um, these ones like one get provider, scope, published location, these actually all come from the PowerShell get provider. Yeah, question. Um, I can see that the source and provider are both arrays. Uh, does that mean you can specify a different thing, so like maybe a UNC path, and then a, like a, just a, a chocolatey repo or, or something like that, and it'll cascade down to try the first one, try the second one? Or does it yeah, and I'm trying to, the question is, he knows that um, this, the, the provider and the source parameters both take arrays, so then what are the semantics around that? And I believe uh, because because one get is able to do the mapping between providers and sources that it just if you it, it tries to uh, resolve those automatically I know that with PowerShell get there were some some issues with trying to do that mapping so I think there there could be cases where it's a little bit ambiguous as to what the semantics are um, but I think I think by default it's just going to try to to hit the sources that are specified against the, the providers that they have specified, if you specify multiple of each. So if you want to find out, um, actually let's take a look at, at uh, install package. Install package has almost the same set of parameters as well. <coughs> and so you can pipe from find package into install package, or you can specify the name of a package directly. So here let's just try to install notepad. And I'm going to specify the verbose parameter so you can see the output, what it's doing. So what it's going to do is it's going to try to um, go through all the providers. Since I didn't specify a provider or a source, it's just going to query all of them and say, hey, do you have something called Notepad2? And uh, if so, go and install that. Now notice that um, it did find it in the Chocolatey repository, um, but then when you go to install it, it's going to prompt because Chocolatey by default is not a trusted source. So I'm going to say yes. And now that went and installed. And if you look at, um, there's another parameter. Let me see if I can scroll back up. I think it's on find, it's on install. Get command install package syntax. For example, here's, an, here's another dynamic parameter, uh, additional arguments that gets exposed by the MSI provider. So you can pass additional parameters to, to the MSI to do things like suppress a reboot or pass key value pairs to the underlying MSI or change launch conditions, things like that if you need to. And some of those uh, will get fleshed out more over time. Yeah, it's important to note on this trust that you know who knows who put that software up there. You know, you just have no idea. So when you see the sys internal <coughs> stuff, I'm going to ask Rasinovich, oh, did you put your stuff up in the chocolatey repository? I said, what are you talking about? So somebody took Mark Rasinovich's code, put it up in the chocolatey repository, and it might be Mark Rasinovich's code. It might be something else. It might be Mark's code plus some malware. We don't know. It's just a community repository. So you got to understand that when you deal with this stuff, right? It's Community repository. Yep. <laughs> That's why you might want to set up your own, go to Mark's, grab his, make yours trusted. Is there, is there any plans for a community <coughs> trusted repository? Because, uh, I mean, yes, chocolatey, we've all been in chocolatey, but yes. Being trusted, is it in any kind of peer reviewing? The question is is there any plans for a trusted repository from Microsoft? For software packages, we don't have anything at this time, uh, but we're certainly looking at looking at those things. Um, for PowerShell Get, we have the PowerShell Gallery, which right now is public. Uh, you can't submit yet, but uh, we're working on that. So that will be for for modules. So the question is, well, okay, how do I know which parameters are coming from which provider? 
So the way to do that, if you look at Get Package Provider, it will help with that. So for example, look at PS Module, just format it as a list, and there's this dynamic options here. That's where you can see the mapping. So as I mentioned, one get provider, location, some of these things, ins installation policy, those are coming from the, uh, the PS module provider. That's how you figure that out. All right, so once a package is installed, you can enumerate uh, the installed packages using get package. So we installed Notepad2, so you can see, um, see that's installed. And notice that, uh, again, it's, we didn't specify any provider, so it's querying all the providers. That's why we come back with an ARP one and a and a chocolatey one. And get package has a set of parameters that are really similar to the other ones. You know, name required, the versioning ones, uh, force bootstrap, message resolver, etc. And then finally, you can uninstall stuff using uninstall package. You can just pipe it like this or specify it however you want. And that'll go and, and uninstall. Now, a key thing to note is a lot of these chocolatey packages, especially, they don't have uninstall scripts. So um, it'll remove the thing, but it won't really, it'll remove the, the chocolatey package, but it won't really have done the uninstallation. So a lot of times they'll need to use like the MSI provider or something that actually knows how to really uninstall the package. Just a thing to note. Cool. So that's a rundown of one get. Let me flip back to the slides. Now let me talk about the other module that we put into WMF5, which is PowerShell GET. So PowerShell GET allows you to easily find, install, and update PowerShell modules. Again, it's layered over one GET, but it's really uh, an experience that's customized and optimized specifically around PowerShell modules. Um, it's integrated with the public PowerShell gallery, so that's kind of a the premier experience that we wanted to have uh, for interacting with with the PowerShell gallery. It's a it is a package manager provider uh, that plugs into OneGet, and currently the preview only supports NuGet based galleries, and we're expanding that to support other types of galleries and sources. But the preview right now supports NuGet, and uh, you can register your repository settings so that they persist across sessions with a similar set of commands that I showed for one get. So uh, you support ProGet then, which is kind of a new get, a private new get server. Did you say ProGet? Yeah. Yeah, you should be able to. If you if you are able to set up that that uh, repository yourself, then you should be able to register uh, the source and location and and work it, use these commands against that. For, for module and DSC resource authors, uh, we provide a really easy mechanism to publish to galleries and then it's easy to keep your modules up to date with multiple versions. Um, we are doing even more work around side-by-side -side versioning that's not quite in there yet. You'll see bits and pieces in the preview but we're fleshing that out over time. Yeah, question? Yeah, it's not completely on topic for this but so forgive my ignorance of DSC but DSC is obviously declaring the state of the server mm -hmm. The server needs an MSI. Mm -hmm. Is there a way I can leverage one get to get that MSI to install the MSI? Sure. Yeah. The, we don't have a DSC resource for for one. Get. Well, we have the we have there are some DSC resources right now that can install things like MSIs. Yes. Do we have a one get? Do we have a one get? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have a resource for one get, and you just say, "Here are the things I want," and we'll go find them on the internet. And Installing for you. So I could set up, say I'm rolling out Exchange Server or Link Server, I could set up a private repository and my DSC, reach out to that for the relevant MSIs and do it sure. okay. Yeah. Uh, you see all the pieces coming together? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. It takes 14 years of building up all the components <laughs> and then they come together. And then, of course, the nice thing about the commandlets in, in PowerShell Git is that the packaging details that get abstracted from through the commandlets from the from the module author, so you don't have to worry about the fact that oh, when I upload to the PowerShell gallery, it's actually got this new spec file underneath, and it's packaged in a nupcake package, and blah blah blah. Um, all you have to worry about is just invoking the commandlet, and we do all that stuff under the covers. And again, it's layered over one get the one get provider model, which gives us the extensibility that uh, to evolve. 
the set of providers and repositories over time. Right. It's PowerShell six is just going to have update update PowerShell, isn't it? No, 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 no. no it's the next version of Windows. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see if I can pull up my PowerShell get demo here. Do you think that Microsoft will provide the one uh, provider where you can download the Microsoft software? That would be excellent, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So as I mentioned, uh, PowerShell Git, you can think of it, it's a package manager. It's not a package manager manager like one Git, but it, and it's specifically designed for, with an experience optimized around PowerShell modules. Finding, installing, updating, and publishing modules. And modules uh, can be stored on online or local repositories. And uh, we leverage one Git's provider model to talk to those repositories. And right now we only support NuGet, but um, I'm going to show you how to use file-based repositories later on, which would be kind of cool. So first of all, let's let's go ahead and import the PowerShell Git module and get a list of commands. Sort noun and verb here. So we've got about what six or eight commandlets here. Uh, the set of module ones, and then the set of repository commandlets. So two two main sets. So first, let's talk about repositories. This should look similar to to one Git. If you look at, we have Git PowerShell repository. This gets the set of registered repositories that we know how to talk to, and by default, we have one that is registered out of the box, which is the public PowerShell gallery. So let's take a closer look at that pipe it to format list. We've got the name of the gallery, the source location, which is typically a URI or a, or a file path, whether it's trusted or not, whether it's registered, um, the installation policy. This is kind of analogous to the trusted concept in OneGit. And then what OneGit provider is used to talk to that gallery and the location where where to publish modules and the, as well as some options for that provider. And then we've got a set of other repository commandlets that are similar. <coughs> registering, unregistering, and then setting to change the name, location, installation policy, things like that. So once you've got all your providers installed and the repositories that you want registered, um, finding modules is, is really simple. You just use find module. <coughs> now, notice we, we also have a bootstrap experience here as well. So the PowerShell gallery is the only gallery registered by default, and that is based on NuGet. So we need the NuGet uh, binary. It's not included. So we prompted if you don't find it to download NuGet so that we can go and talk to the PowerShell gallery. And this is just going to go and, and try to uh, query all the providers for all the repositories they know how to talk to and then get back a list from all those repositories and, and combine that together, which can take a while. The other thing to note while this is coming back is um, we do have a wildcard experience on find module. There we go. You can see a lot of DSC resources in there, whatnot. We do have a wildcard experience on find module, um, which does take real PowerShell wildcards. But again, because uh, it's not plumbed through into the OneGit provider, the thing to note here is that all of this filtering is going to happen on the client, so it will be pretty slow. It's got to you know go get the full list and then do the filtering on the client. And we're working with the OneGit team to see how we can get that plumbed all the way through to the server so that it's a lot faster. If you look at the syntax, we have a set of versioning parameters. Again, they're really similar to the ones that are on all the other module commandlets and the ones on OneGit minimum required, et cetera. 
you can scope a search to a specific repository. So for example, let's look for PS Readline. Just use the repository parameter there. And then install it using install module or pipe it from find module. Let's use our required version parameter here to select a specific version. And again, you're going to get a prompt because even the PowerShell gallery, even though it's Microsoft, uh, it's not trusted by default. You've got to make an explicit opt-in that you want to install from there because we're not the only ones who are publishing code there. And if you do get module list, we should see it installed now. There it is. Um, you can override that trusted prompt with um, dash force, but you can also change the, re the register repository directly using set ps repository. So let's just do that. PS gallery. This is our installation policy. Trusted. So now if we go in, the other thing to note about this is because we're running as admin, install module detected that and goes and installs in the program files location so that it can be accessible from all users. So if you go in here, um, modules, and let's delete our PS read line out of there. If we go install module again, PS read line, okay, that, that went in, there was no prompt. So we were, we were fully trusted. So you can do that with the force or, or changing your, your installation policy with the command line. You can also change where the thing gets installed using the scope parameter. So you can change it and, and force it to install um, to the current user. Now, if you just, since I already installed it for all users, if I run this again, even though I specify current user, it's going to see that the current user already has access to that module. So it'll just silently succeed. Um, but I can override that with force if I want. And then that'll go and install it. To both locations if you need it. Yeah, question? Oh, okay, time. All right, so, okay, so let's get to the, the cool part, which is um, now the cool part. The cool part. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all great, um, as long as all the modules you want to install are in the PS gallery or are in um, other public repositories. So what if you want to set up your own private uh, internal repository? Well. You, you have a, yeah, question, Steve. So, uh, like the PS Readline example, yeah. if uh, you've already had that installed and it's loaded, yeah. like what if you try to update it? So the question is, uh, with PS Readline, if, if I've already installed it and it's loaded, what if I update it? Um, if it's updated, let's see, if it's a binary module, then it can't be, it can't be unloaded from the session. And since the semantics are of update are to overwrite, by default, until we get more side-by-side -side versioning, then then you'd have to uh, close your session down. Yep. To, to do. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Yep. So you can um, you can follow these instructions up here on. There's like if you go to GitHub. On the internet. The internet. It's really cool. Gallery. If you go to NuGet, NuGet Gallery, you can, you know, build and run your own gallery with Visual Studio 2013, NuGet Azure, you get the Azure pack, clone it, build it, set it up in IS Express, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> you can do that if you want, which is pretty involved, but works and it gives you a nice web interface. Um, I'm going to show you how to create a simple file-based <laughs> NuGet repository. So. The trick here is this isn't totally implemented yet, so um, I'm going to show you how to make a couple tweaks to the September preview to unlock this. 
the first thing we need to do, so you want to do this on a machine that you don't really care about, because this is just kind of <laughs> totally experimental. <laughs> um, this is not like recommended in production or anything. Oh. We're going to <laughs> take, take ownership of the PowerShell get module so that we can edit it. Uh, let me try that again. Okay, and then let's go into that really quick. Property, security, edit that, give administrators full access to it. It's a system file. Don't do this, okay? <laughs> now we're going to edit it. Okay, this is where it starts to get a little crazy, but bear with me. Um, so we're going to edit. There's basically five places we got to we got to tweak, and they're all almost the same thing. So this is in this is in the register ps repository okay. function, and down here <coughs> where we go and we look at the published location, this thing where it says dot two string. That works great for your URLs. It doesn't work great for files. So what we're going to do is we're going to comment that out. And we're going to tweak it a little bit. So if the scheme is file, instead of dot two string, we're going to grab the local path. Otherwise, we're going to leave it and grab the absolute URI. And then we need to make the same tweak here for the location parameter. Let's see. So if the scheme is file, then we're going to do local path. Otherwise, we're going to do a URI. So that takes care of our register. Now we want to make the same change in set PS repository. So we come down in here to publish location, comment that out. I got this right. If it's file based, get rid of the two string local path. Otherwise, you guys are watching, make sure I didn't do any typos, right? <laughs> Absolute URI. And then same thing for source location. Last one. If it's file, local, otherwise, absolute URI. And then one, la one final tweak we want to make is 1599, it's in a helper function called add package source, where we test for the name if it's not. We had to add one more condition here for when it's file based. then we don't need to test for it being a web URI. All right, so if I typed everything correctly. Did I? All right, let me check it. Let me check it really quick. Um, modules, PowerShell. 
Yeah. Let me skip to that. It's line 1599. I think this is right. It was in the second edit you did. Oh, it was the second edit. Yeah, yeah. Further up in yeah, set. In set. Where did I go? I think was it in the, in the first line you skipped to? Will you provide your modified module? How about this? <laughs> yes, I will. Let's just see if it works. <laughs> 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 Don't want to take too much time here. All right, so we had to close our old PowerShell because we're going to import the new version that hopefully will work. So we register our new one. This repository, let's give it a name. Actually, first we got to set up our a place where we want to do it. So let's just go into the temp folder here and create a my repo. Now I had this working cross machine earlier, um, but the hotel networking didn't like having two VMs with the same MAC address. It was going haywire. So I'm doing this all on one machine, but you can do the same thing with UNC, like a UNC share, SMB share. This can be a, a remote share here. Uh, let's call it file repo, source location, temp, what did I call it, my repo? Uh, Publish. There we go. Installation policy, trusted. Got to specify the one get provider, which is NuGet. Let's do verbose to see if this is going to work. Oh, that's where I messed it up. Don't know if that worked. Looks like it worked. So you can see I've got file repo here now registered. So if I do get ps repository, my file repo, the source location is this uh, file share. Same thing with the published location. So if I run find module, Cool. So it didn't find any modules. We didn't publish anything there yet. So let's go ahead and make a module. Yeah. Almost. About five minutes. Yeah, less than five. Okay. Like three. So let's make a MyContoso module really quick in the temp directory. And a cool new feature, new item. If you haven't seen this yet, you no longer have to specify file type. Uh, item type file. Yeah, question? Yeah, the question is, are the source and published locations both UNC yeah. paths? Yes, yes. You can, yes, you can uh, have the source and the published path both be UNC paths, correct. That was my original demo till the hotel networking blew it up. So this is much easier now. I love that change. It's really handy. Make a PSM one. Let's go edit our PSM one really quick in the ISC. I'm just going to add a function, get Contoso. There we go. Now let's edit our PSD one. I'm old school. I like to edit these things by hand, I've done a million of them, so module version, let's make this our 1.0, specify our root module, uh, let's see, my contoso.psm1, there we go, and now we're ready to publish the module. So let's go publish module. 
repository is file repo. Path is C temp my Contoso. And then you got to specify this NuGet API key for right now. You can just put anything here. Um, for both, it'll just ignore it. And this is a key key aspect I want to point out is that um, by default, we're trying to figure out what we should allow to publish. Here you notice it failed because we're blocking. You need at least uh, description and author. So if I go in, uh, no, that's the PSM one. So PSD one, and I go add a description. Um, I don't know, partial rocks. Um, author, Contoso. And I run my published module. There we go. Published successfully to our C temp file based repo. Now, if I run my find module here, my Contoso should find it searching through all the providers and there it is and you can install it should work there you go Dan, tell about best practices. Uh, yeah best practices around publishing no about enforcing yeah enforcing best practice so we're trying to figure out right now what what uh, sort of rules we should have around publishing and what the quality bar is that we should enforce uh, in order for people to be able to publish. And uh, we have some tools that we're working on to kind of help enforce that and help gauge the quality of modules and the quality of scripts do that we're going to be using as part of publishing. Do you want to add that to some, uh, as a discussion point when we do our best practices conversation Wednesday? Yeah, that'd okay, be great. Then we will. I'll that'd put be great. Slide there. I'll see if I can, I can pull together the rules that we have right now. Cool. So we can uh, have that as part of the discussion. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys.